Dear friends, welcome, dear Deputy uh, Secretary of State Wendy Sherman. We're very honored to have you here, that you've chosen uh, Friends of Europe as your uh, partners of choice for this uh, uh, joint event. We're not delighted or honored because of uh, the fact that you found some time in your busy schedule or not specifically because of your track record within the State Department, amongst others as the uh, lead negotiator of the Iran uh, deal in 2015. But I think most of all, uh, because of your, um, you serve as a role model when it comes to leadership and women leadership. Uh, just like, if I can say that, uh, your mentor and friend, I think, Madeleine Albright, that we also had the pleasure of hosting a few years ago, and that sadly, who sadly uh, passed away uh, recently. Today we had, we're here at uh, Town Hall Europe, uh, the Davignon Centre for New Leadership, which was co-founded by Friends of Europe in 2019 as a clear commitment to signal a clear commitment in fact to uh, our work around new more inclusive more diverse forms of leadership um, and our work and responsible citizenship as well uh, and our work in the field of uh, peace security and defense uh, which we've been having for about uh, 20 years uh, in partnership also with our transatlantic uh, allies um, has been uh, one of uh, an all of society, a whole of society approach, uh, with also a clear focus on the role of women in peace and security, and we hope obviously to continue doing that. Uh, a final word before I pass on to the man I always say who invented moderation, uh, Demendra Kanani. I'd like to kind of say one final word uh, on the context. Um, the geopolitical context of your visit today is the one that we know, which is uh, not ideal, which is complicated, where uh, we wouldn't have imagined another war on the, in the field of Europe, another sign of aggression in Europe. It was completely unexpected, I have to say, for a lot of us, which is sad, and we can only hope that you, together with other actors, can uh, help find solutions as much as possible. I just couldn't help, in a rather naive way perhaps, to end with, a, with something that may look like a piece of hope hope that we are inspired by the resilience of the people in Ukraine, first of all. And secondly, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with the work of uh, somebody called Joe Bonamassa. He's a, an American blues and rock guitar player. Great, great uh, musician, I'm a great fan of his work. Fact is, I didn't know him until I was introduced to his music by one of the former Russian ambassadors to NATO. And I always think by myself, well, if, if, the, if we can share the love for music and for culture and things like that, we just have to keep the hope that at some point we can share also uh, the, the, the need to live in a peaceful and prop, prosperous world together with all citizens. So, and with that, I'd like to pass over to Demendra. Many thanks for your coming here. Thank you, Geert. <clears throat> you can take this with me. Can I take it? Yes, absolutely. Um, warm welcome from me, Damendra Kanani. Those of you who don't know, I'm Chief Spokesperson at Friends of Europe, but also Director of many things, including Peace, Security, Defence, Asia, Space and Digital. It gives me a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, thank you for joining us. As Geert says, thank you for choosing us to set out um, the vision uh, that you have of what we do in the context we find ourselves and some of the key things and the relationship issues that we need to build on. But before I turn to that, Wendy, if I may, just to set the context and framework for this conversation, um, it occurs to us at Friends of Europe, but also myself, that we're meeting at a particularly distinct moment in time um, on the back of the biggest health crisis, which has led to the biggest economic crisis that's actually fundamentally changing our health, economic health and our economic stability. And we're not, uh, we're not out of that. And then suddenly we, we're hit left field by a, a, a criminal inv invasion of Ukraine, uh, which unsettles the rules-based world that we live in. And it feels like the norms that were set post-war, the norms in, in terms of what we believed as diplomatic relations and how things would definitely work out are stretched to their limits. And perhaps it's a time to really rethink whether the, you know, the rules of the game are fit for purpose now in the 21st century, whether we need to actually rethink some of those uh, underpinned by values, but is it time to rethink some of those uh, norms that uh, we are living with, especially given that the Ukraine invasion has fundamentally unsettled and unpicked 
all the work that's been done over the past 60 years to create a more stable, peace, peaceful world. And on that note, Wendy, I'm going to turn to you because I know that you want to be able to share with us your thinking around uh, the implications of the Ukraine war. What does that say about the US's po uh, uh, foreign policy objectives? But more importantly, the, the the further importance uh, of the transatlantic relationship, multilateralism, but also what that means in terms of what we do with the kinds of dynamics that we're witnessing with the PRC. Um, and so uh, I'm, we're all looking forward to your thoughts on the kind of the foreign policy picture, if you like, the relationship with the, with the, with the EU, which becomes even stronger poten potentially, and what we do jointly and collectively to make sure we take people with us on the journey for global liberal de democratic processes as opposed to alienation. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, you know, at the end of the day, besides all the work that we all do on world affairs, on foreign policy and national security, we all also live lives. Uh, and I just want to note uh, this afternoon as we get started that all of our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Foreign Minister Wilmis who I've had the pleasure of meeting with, uh, who announced today that she's taking an unpaid leave of absence as Belgium's uh, foreign minister because her husband has uh, an aggressive brain cancer. Uh, and I think it just reminds us all that as we do these really important things in terms of the world, we all are sometimes brought back down to earth with uh, the people that we love, uh, our friends, our families, our colleagues, uh, and it's always important to remember each other. I always tell our incoming Foreign Service officers, at the end of the day, when you're finished your career, and mine is almost finished, you can tell by my hair, <laughs> what you have left besides the good work you may have done are your families and your friends, uh, and so don't forget them. Make sure you spend time with them. <laughs> Don't put everything you do into the work that you do. Integrate your work and your life. Um, so uh, thinking of her uh, this afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining to talk about the big picture of the world. I especially want to thank Friends of Europe, including your co-founder, Hert, uh, for organizing today's event and for that nice uh, introduction. And thank you, Dharmendra, uh, for agreeing to serve as moderator and for your excellent overview and introduction of what we're going to talk about this afternoon. I also want to say in personal terms, I'm standing here, but this chair is here because I recently had some back surgery, so if my back gives out, I'm going to sit down on that chair. Uh, I also want to say a warm welcome to the College of Europe students, exchange program alumni, and all the young professionals and researchers who are here in person and joining us online. Uh, before I became Deputy Secretary of State, the first woman uh, to ever hold this position, which is sort of nuts, uh, that it took to uh, 2021 uh, to make that happen, um, I was teaching at uh, Harvard Kennedy School uh, and was working with many of you, people just like you, uh, and found it the most energizing thing I've done in a long time because all of the young people in this audience have already done more with your lives than I've done with my many years in life. You all are entrepreneurial and filled with energy and ideas and enthusiasm, and we need every bit of it in this very challenging world uh, that Mindra mentioned. So I'm really looking for a lively and engaging discussion, so raise your hand even if you haven't figured out yet what question you want to ask. By the time you get called on, you'll think of something. <laughs> From the very beginning of the Biden-Harris administration, we have been restoring and strengthening America's network of alliances and partnerships, the cornerstone of our policy. And there's a very simple reason for that. No matter how strong any country's military is, no matter how big its economy, no matter how significant its natural resources or how creative its people, no nation, no nation, can address the biggest challenges of the 21st century or take full advantage of its opportunities by acting alone. The COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis, cybersecurity, disinformation, food and water security, all of these challenges cross borders, regions, 
and domains of expertise, and that means they can only be addressed by working together. From President Biden, Vice President Harris, and Secretary Blinken on down, we have reinvested in our most important relationships, including the transatlantic NATO alliance, the G7, and our very strong partnership with the European Union. We have strengthened our treaty alliances and other partnerships in the Indo-Pacific, elevating the Quad with India, Japan, and Australia, and launching AUKUS with Australia and the United Kingdom. We're also investing in strengthening our bilateral and multilateral relationships in South and Central America, across Africa, in the Middle East, and in Southeast Asia, where we see ASEAN centrality as critical to the future of the world and the region. As Secretary Blinken often says, the United States sees the EU as our partner of first resort. That's reflected in many dialogues and consultations we've launched over the last year, including the Trade and Technology Council, which will meet again next month, and the US-EU-China dialogue, and the US-EU consultations on the Indo-Pacific, which have brought me to Brussels this week. These dialogues are not a make-work exercise or a diplomatic photo op, though you would not know it from all the cameras. They offer both sides the opportunity to deepen our understanding of each other's policy positions and priorities, to discuss shared challenges and opportunities, to formulate ideas and initiatives where we actually work together, and above all, strengthen our relationships at every level. It's through this work that we build the mutual understanding, respect, and trust that is so critical to responding quickly and decisively in moments of crisis like the one we face right now. All of us, I am sure, are paying close attention to Ukraine and the consequences of the premeditated, unprovoked, unjustified, and utterly horrifying war of choice that Russian President Vladimir Putin has unleashed there. On every front, the United States and our allies and partners, the EU chief among them, are united with Ukraine and working in lockstep to respond to Putin's war. We are surging defensive support to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. We are providing substantial humanitarian aid, and we applaud the European nations who have welcomed more than five million Ukrainian refugees with open arms. And of course, we are imposing severe coordinated costs and consequences on Putin and his enablers, as we warned him we would. The United States and our allies and partners have imposed wide-ranging sanctions, export controls, visa designations, and other measures. As a result, more than half of Russia's high-tech imports have been cut off. More than 80% of assets in the Russian banking sector are now under sanction. The US and our partners have announced more than 62 designations, more than 2,100 Russian and Belarusian individuals and entities, including President Putin and his adult daughters, senior government officials and their families, and business leaders who are enabling the Kremlin's war. Looking at the situation in Ukraine, one can only conclude that Putin believed his own propaganda. He believed the Ukrainian people would welcome the Russian invasion, that the Ukrainian military would not put up a fight, that he could easily topple the democratically elected government in Kyiv. He believed that NATO would fracture, that the EU wasn't capable of reacting quickly, that the international community would be indifferent. He has been proven wrong at every turn. Ukraine is putting up an extraordinary resistance to defend their nation, its sovereignty, and its future. Russia is being made weaker on virtually every measure. The transatlantic alliance is stronger than it has ever been. Nations around the world have taken unprecedented steps to oppose Putin's war and support the people of Ukraine. And the rules-based international order hasn't been shattered. Instead, Putin's actions are rallying the world to reinforce and revitalize that order. At the United Nations, 141 countries voted to condemn Putin's invasion and just four nations 
stood with Russia. You can probably guess who they were. The Council of Europe, the UN Human Rights Council, and other international bodies have expelled or suspended Russia. At the same time, it is important to recognize that not everyone in the world is experiencing Putin's war against Ukraine in the same way. Families have been thrown back into poverty by two years of this grinding pandemic. Putin's war is causing chaos in the oil and gas markets, driving up energy prices for those who can least afford it. It is disrupting international shipping of critical commodities like wheat that millions of people depend on to survive, raising food prices and threatening to push more people into hunger. Although Putin's war is the reason behind rising prices for food, fuel, fertilizer, and other basics, it's incumbent upon the international community to step up and take action to prevent a global food security crisis or deal with the one that it appears we already have. I joined a UN Security Council meeting last month to discuss this very issue, and US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen convened a high-level meeting earlier this week to urge greater action from international financial institutes, institutions to deal with food insecurity. I expect you will see more activity in the weeks and days ahead, but I don't want to get ahead, get ahead of anyone's announcements. Ultimately, Putin's war against Ukraine will impact every nation and every person in the world because a threat to the rules-based international order anywhere risks undermining it everywhere. No country has the right to dictate another country's political choices or to change another country's boundaries by force or to choose another country's alliances for them. Those are rights inherent to each sovereign state. In a democracy like Ukraine, they are rights that belong to the people. And when autocrats like Putin believe they can act with impunity and violate these rules and principles, that makes all of us less secure. As I mentioned at the outset, I am here in Brussels for the third round of the US-EU Dialogue on China, which I launched with my counterpart, EEAS Secretary General Stefano Sanino, on my first trip as Deputy Secretary last May. Even as the eyes of the world are on Ukraine, we are continuing our diplomatic engagements in every region on the entire slate of challenges we face. That includes the People's Republic of China. The United States has been clear that we will compete and compete vigorously with the PRC where we should, including on trade and the economy, technology and innovation and other areas we have also been clear that we are committed to managing this competition between our countries so that competition does not veer into conflict. We will cooperate with the PRC where it is in our interest and indeed in the world's interest to do so, hopefully on such things as climate change, global health, counter narcotics, and nonproliferation. And we will challenge, contest the PRC where we must such as when Beijing takes actions that run counter to our values and interests and those of our allies and partners, or which threaten the rules-based international order we have all worked so hard to build. And in fact, the PRC has itself been one of the biggest beneficiaries of that rules-based international order over the last half century. Trade and economic development have built a booming middle class and lifted millions of people out of extreme poverty. Today, however, Beijing is seeking to undermine the very system that they benefited from, to return instead to a system where might makes right, and big nations can coerce smaller countries into acting against their own interests. We've seen the PRC's playbook in action right here in Europe. This is about the time I'm going to sit on the chair. After Lithuania, announced a new Taiwan representative office in Vilnius. The PRC launched an all-out campaign to economically coerce Lithuania into changing its political choice, including by blocking imports of its goods and third country goods made with Lithuanian components, 
This and other attempts at economic coercion amount to no more than bullying, not only of the nations in question, but of the European continent and the common market as a whole. The PRC's coercive actions go beyond governments as well. They have targeted companies like H&M, Adidas, and Nike for choosing to remove products made with forced labor from Xinjiang from their supply chains, both to punish the companies for their actions and to discourage others from standing up to the PRC's human rights abuses. Less than three weeks before Putin launched his unprovoked war against Ukraine, actually 20 days earlier, he and PRC President Xi Jinping declared that the PRC and Russia have a, quote, no limits partnership, unquote, with, quote, no forbidden areas, unquote, of cooperation. Since then, we've seen the PRC signal its support for Russia on multiple fronts. The PRC has failed to condemn Russian war crimes and voted against the resolution to expel Russia from the Human Rights Council. They have repeatedly drawn false equivalencies between Russia's war of aggression and Ukraine's self-defensive actions. PRC state media has parroted the Kremlin's disinformation, including absurd claims that Ukraine and NATO posed a security threat to Russia. I could give dozens of examples of PRC actions that seek to undermine nation's political autonomy, to coerce businesses' decision-making and more, to literally steal intellectual property and trade secrets, to hunt down and silence human right defenders and members of ethnics and ethnic and religious minorities who have left the PRC, to bend the rules of the international system to suit their interests at the expense of the rest of the world. These are some of the reasons why last year we launched the US-EU Dialogue on China. To understand each other's perspectives and experiences, to share information and raise concerns with each other, and above all, to converge on a common approach to strengthening the rules-based order we built together in the first place. Here's the bottom line. The question all of us face in the United States, in Europe, in nations around the world, it's a simple one. What do we want the world to look like? What do we want our future to be? What do I want my eight and six-year-old grandsons to have when they grow up? We want to have societies where people are free to speak their minds, to call a war by its name, and to peacefully protest, or societies where governments are free to crack down harshly on anyone who contradicts the party line. Do we want to have governments that are transparent and accountable to their people, or governments that exist to consolidate their own power and control their people in turn? Do we want a global economy that works for working families and the middle class, or one that further enriches those who are already wealthy beyond measure? Do we want to have an internet that is a tool for international connection, for discovery and innovation, or an internet that is a tool of coercion and disinformation? Do we want to trust in each other to embrace our ability to come together and solve our common challenges, to recognize our mutual humanity and build a better world? Or do we want to be at war and in conflict with each other? I know how I'd answer those questions. I expect you know how you would answer those questions as well. We have decades of evidence that free, open, democratic societies are more innovative, more prosperous, and more peaceful. That's not to say our countries are without challenges, without flaws and shortcomings. We all have painful histories full of examples of times when we have fallen short of our values. We all struggle with contemporary inequalities that keep us from reaching our highest goals. But one of the strengths of a democratic system that we can acknowledge those issues, that we face those issues. We don't have to rewrite our histories to flatter ourselves or to soothe our egos. We don't have to sweep ugliness under the rug or censor opinions we don't like. We can face up to our problems and talk about them openly. We can debate the best way to go about fixing them, including at forums like this one. 
it can make our system seem more contentious, and sometimes they are pretty contentious. It can sometimes be uncomfortable, and it can certainly be messy. But ultimately, wrestling with difficult issues openly, based on facts and evidence with accountability and transparency, that helps us come to more durable solutions. It surfaces new ideas and new voices. It makes us stronger which is why it is critical that the United States and Europe not only recommit ourselves to strengthening our relationship with each other, but to delivering results for our own people and for people around the world, to continue demonstrating how democracies work, how we deliver, really deliver, growth and prosperity, creativity and innovation, higher standards of living, all the while embracing human rights, freedom of speech and the press, and diversity in all its forms. As Hert mentioned, a little less than a month ago, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright died, the first woman Secretary of State in the United States. I was lucky to be her counselor when she was Secretary. She was then my former boss. She later became my private sector business partner. She was a beloved teacher at Georgetown and everywhere and a very dear friend. Above all, she was a fierce champion of democracy. She fought for democratic systems and democratic futures with everything she had to the very end of her life, literally. Because like many of you here in Europe and your parents and grandparents, she knew the alternative all too painfully and all too personally her family fled Hitler, her family fled communism. She came to the United States as a refugee and loved more than anything the day she became a U.S. citizen. She believed we could always do better, and so do I. So does the United States. So does Europe, and so do people all over the world. Thank you again for having me, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy, if I may say, that was uh, brilliant insofar as you, that whole speech ricocheted with that human touch. You brought mm -hmm. it back to the choices we have as people and communities. And it's rare that we, we have the opportunity to have someone with your kind of background, but also responsibility to not just leave it at the fact that, you know, leaders need to engage, but actually we collectively, individually, have choices and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I'm going to err on the side of the audience rather than engage in a conversation with you, if I may, because we have lots of people here with their hands already up, um, and thank you. What I'm going to say to you is that um, we have literally under, just over 30 minutes. It's a hard stop at four. I'm really clear about that, unfortunately. <laughs> so what I need you to do, please, no speeches, no deconstructions of the situation. We know that. But if you have offering solutions or ideas or thoughts and reflections in response to what Wendy said, please do so. But I will cut you off if you go on for more than 60 seconds. Sorry, <laughs> forgive me in advance for that. But, you know, be good citizens to each other. You've all turned up to be here. So I'm going to... Uh, I know a lot of the men have got their hands up first, but I'm going to go to one of the young women who are from the College of Europe, if I can find you. I don't know where you are. Hey! Great. So, could we have the mic here with, with the young, lady, uh, young woman with the glasses and the green top and jacket? And I'll come to others in a moment. I'll take three. Um, yeah. so. Do introduce yourself. Uh, yes, my name is... Okay, hello, my name is uh, Veronica Furman. I'm from the College of Europe. Sorry. Um, I have two quick questions, one of them being about the NATO strategic concept and whether you think that the US will lobby towards uh, reorienting NATO, maybe also towards uh, China. And my second question um, is about, uh, you were talking how the Biden-Harris administration uh, was pivoting towards um, trying to th uh, strengthen friendships and how the midterms uh, might affect this um, yeah, uh, search. 
Veronica, if I may, what's before before you go? Just yes. what's your view? What would you like to see happen? Very briefly. <laughs> Um, I know it's tough, but... I, th I feel like I'm stealing <laughs> away the time of people. <laughs> okay, well, if you, you know, please don't hesitate, because, I mean, part of this is about the brain in this room as well, yeah. uh, and give, coming up with ideas and solutions. I want to give opportunity to people to be able to ask questions, but also their ideas. Lady here. Hello, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Uh, my name is Viktor Amelianka, I'm a student of College of Europe, and I'm Ukrainian. I'm very grateful for your position and for your speech. And my question is, um, how do you think the end of war can be like um, in coming time? And what the USA can do now to help Ukraine win this war? And the second question is, uh, how do you see the further diplomatic context uh, of engagement with Russia in terms of the United Nations and OSCE? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Thanks. So I'm going to go right at the back. The gentleman, this, sir, and then I'll bring yourself in. And then I get to answer. And you'd get to answer, absolutely. Okay. This is the, I promise, this is the last of the three. Okay. Sorry. Could you introduce yourself and take the mic, please? It's important that you do, so oh. people can hear you. <laughs> Secretary of State, uh, I'm Saris Wolski from European Parliament, from Poland. My question is as follows. Uh, the result of the Russian-Ukrainian war, will it influence the confrontation with China in Asia-Pacific, the eventual winning of this war or defeat? Uh, what's the synergy or, or not synergy between the two? Because you refer to both theaters. Uh, in fact, whether Ukrainian victory over Russia will nullify the putin xi gambit, ending two-front simultaneous threat for US and allies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, They're not, you know, really, you know, yeah, talking yeah, yeah. questions, aren't they? So, really? No, yeah. it's simple. So on the strategic concept, NATO's a strategic concept for 2030, I actually uh, met with several of the PERM reps at NATO yesterday for a discussion uh, not focused on China, but obviously discussed Russia, Ukraine as well. And uh, there's no question that the strategic concept that might have been written a year ago is probably going to be a little different than the strategic concept written now. And I think that's all being thought through. I think the point that Damindra made at the beginning is an important one. Um, you know, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, a student of the UN, uh, very much a student of the UN, uh, always went about saying the UN Charter is everything. Well, Putin completely threw out the UN Charter uh, with this unprovoked, unjust invasion of Ukraine. Uh, sovereignty, territorial integrity, the right of countries to make its own choice. And one of the most uh, powerful meetings I've ever sat in is I was uh, honored to represent uh, the United States at the uh, Russia-NATO Council meeting when we were trying to solve this problem diplomatically and sat there for four hours while 30 NATO allies all said the same thing to the Russian delegation. It was extraordinary. Because uh, we believe in these principles, right? And we thought Russia did too. It seems not so much, or at least Vladimir Putin doesn't so much. So yes, I do think it will change from what it might have been. There are many things that will be the same, uh, but the world is different and the challenge is ahead with technology and quantum computing and AI and cyber and all of this space as a domain uh, has to change everyone's thoughts about security. Climate is a security challenge. Food insecurity is a security challenge. It's not to say everything is a security challenge, but the world is a very different place, I think, than it was when the last strategic concept was written. Midterms, uh, what she's asking about is the United States in a year will have uh, our midterm elections. Uh, generally, historically, in our country, uh, the party that isn't the presidency uh, wins the midterm election and the House and the Senate in our Congress change party control. It hasn't always happened, but mm, pretty much always it happens, in part because people like to say, well, I like some of the things you did, but I didn't like some of the things you didn't do, and uh, it will change uh, some of the things we're able to do. But on these issues, on Russia, Ukraine, on the PRC, strong bipartisan support. On the Transatlantic Alliance, on NATO, on the European Union, strong bipartisan support. 
You saw the delegations that showed up at the Munich, Munich Security Conference, Democrats and Republican members of Congress. So I think on the issues that we're talking about today, strong bipartisan support. Um, end of war. I'm Ukrainian too. Uh, my grandmother uh, was born in Ukraine at the time it was the Soviet Union uh, in Peryaslev. Uh, and um, so I want the war to end too. More than anything, I think the people of Ukraine want the war to end. And part of Russia's disinformation campaign is to say that we don't want, the United States and our allies don't want the war to end. Uh, we want it to come down to the last Ukrainian. We want what the people of Ukraine want. And they want the brutality and the killing of their families, of their citizens to end. I also believe, listening to President Zelensky, they don't want to give up their country. They don't want to give up their territory, their sovereignty, and their right to make their own choices. And so I'm for whatever Ukraine wants. I'm not going to be any more or less Ukraine than Ukraine. It's Ukraine's future. And what we are all trying to do, we and Europe, is to support Ukraine to defend itself to get them the weapons they need, to uh, get them the budget support and financial support they need, uh, to get them the humanitarian assistance, to get the frontline countries the assistance they need, uh, to make sure that frontline countries that are NATO allies, that they have the defense they need, um, that we support those countries who are taking in refugees, the United States, in every way we can, and we do our fair share as well. Um, so that's what I want. Um, in terms of engaging with Russia and the OSCE and the UN, these are very hard choices. I think Russia, the sense is Russia should stay in the OSCE because it's a place where uh, that, is the, that is the reason for the OSCE, is to have dialogue about security and cooperation in Europe. Um, the UN, they are a permanent member of the Security Council. We'd have to change the charter. That'd probably be a pretty hard thing to do, particularly because China's on the Security Council as well. Uh, we've seen uh, the UN use the UN General Assembly more than the Security Council now uh, to make its views known. So I think we'll probably see some changes in that regard. But obviously, they are suspended from uh, the Human Rights Council. Uh, I think uh, we will see them suspended from other international organizations as well. Um, Russia, Ukraine, and will it influence uh, uh, what happens with the PRC? I certainly hope the PRC will learn the right lessons from this, that you cannot separate the United States from its allies and partners, and Europe cannot separate its, will not separate itself from like-minded countries, the United States, uh, other countries in Asia uh, that are like-minded, that we are all going to be together. I think we all surprised ourselves, to be perfectly honest, at how much we came together, how fast we got the work done. Remember, this is like, what, six weeks old? Feels like a year, maybe two or three years, actually. But it's like weeks old, what we have done. It's extraordinary. So. Everyone should pat themselves on their back a little bit and then go back to work because this is very hard and it's not over. Indeed. Thank you very much. I know that you know that point you make about multilateralism felt like a limp squid uh, uh, six or eight m months ago in particular. Now suddenly we have a revival of it and so, so, and that's so much the better. So we have... Those of you who want to kind of come in, try and think about the Europe conversation but also what we do with the PRC. So I'm going to go right to the back. Uh, the gentleman with the red tie there and then I'll come to yourself here and then yourself. There will be the three, and I will try and get as many of you as possible. But that, re that means that you have to be brief. I'll be very quick. Say who you are. Bart Sheftrick at GMF and Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks. I'm actually a co-author of a book titled Partners of First Resort, which echoed a lot of the arguments you made today and very much um, uh, support everything that you said. I want to ask a question on Ukraine and how to help Ukraine win. In addition to all the measures that have already been done in terms of supplying arms, protecting refugees, and providing humanitarian aid, one area that hasn't been maybe given as much focus yet is sustaining Ukraine's wartime economy. Now, it's projected to contract by a half 
from 155 billion to half of that. Okay. And it's an area that needs sustenance because uh, there are still, you know, with all the refugees that have fled Ukraine, there are still 38 million people in Ukraine that still need to be sheltered and provided food. So in your book, are you making a, have you offered a solution as to how you maintain the world? This the was a year and a half ago, so not on sustaining Ukraine's okay. economy. But um, just to have you reflect maybe on okay. potential ideas, one is to have the EBRD host the donor conference. And mm -hmm. the issue here is just the magnitude of the, of the problem. Okay. This is in the billions of dollars of need. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Lady here in the white jacket, before I take you yourself, please again introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Valentina Vasilyeva, Voice of America, Eurasian Division, Russian Service. So, uh, you said that the PRC already shows signals of support to Russia. Do the U.S. have cl clear plan what the U.S. Uh, would do if China would really uh, supply something, military support to Russia or help Russia avoid sanctions? Do you have clear measures, measures in mind? Sanctions. Tough question, which is on everyone's minds, actually. Um, gentleman at the back with the blue jacket, sorry. That will be the third one. Um, thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to talk, Deputy um, Secretary Sherman. It's, it's, it's an honor. Uh, I'm Nima Harry. I'm from the, the young liberals, uh, the Belgian liberals, the same party as Sophie Wilmez. And uh, thank you for those remarks. It was very touching. Uh, and I want to go back to this element of work-life balance. Uh, for the youth that want to get into this uh, field, whether it's to become a diplomat or uh, to go into politics, what, do you, how do, what suggestions do you give, do you give mm -hmm. to the youth to really be able to embark by maintaining good work-life balance, but also be able to dedic be dedicated and persevere in the, adversary, uh, in the challenges that will you know, come with, uh, with the work? And the second question I have is, uh, as you've met leaders uh, around the world, and especially, for example, uh, President Zelensky, who was an unlikely uh, leader, uh, and, and as you mentioned, Madeleine Albright, the, the, the types of leaders that went through adversity to become leaders, how, how does one identify what the, the ingredient of a successful leader is early on? That, that, for me, it's interesting as you've had experience of going around the Thank world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so on uh, the wartime economy, mm -hmm. Hugely important question. The IMF World Bank meetings are being held, finishing up uh, tomorrow. Uh, and Secretary Yellen's been very actively engaged uh, on the food security issue. The United States has already given $500 million to the World Bank. We're going to do another $500 million. And this is in budget support. Uh, I think that um, uh, Europe has been very uh, much trying to provide help and support. But as you note, it's billions of dollars, and the IMF World Bank has now said it's about $5 billion a month uh, that uh, Ukraine needs. So, uh, and this isn't even getting into reconstruction, which will be staggering amounts of money. Mm. Uh, so the world is very focused on this, how to keep paying salaries, how to make sure people can still function uh, while the war goes on and hopefully ends soon. So glad you brought it up. We're all very hard at work on this very essential question. So thank you for that. Um, on, uh, and the idea of EBRD uh, having, I think, uh, Christine Lagarde was at uh, the IMF World Bank meeting, so I'm sure uh, she's cooking up all kinds of ideas. Uh, Christine's fantastic. Um, what to do if China would give material support? Uh, we have, uh, uh, President Biden has spoken to Xi Jinping directly, uh, Jake Sullivan, our national security advisor, to Yang Yichur, Secretary Blinken to Foreign Minister Wang Yi. I myself have spoken to uh, more than one uh, folk in uh, the PRC. Um, and we've been very direct uh, that they have seen what we have done uh, in terms of sanctions, export controls, designations vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So it should give them some idea of the menu from which we could choose uh, if indeed uh, China were to provide material support. But let's be clear, China's already doing things that do not help this situation. Uh, passing disinformation, just whole hog. Uh, whatever Russia says, they say. One of my favorites is that the United States is uh, uh, given uh, bioweapons uh, to the bio labs in Ukraine. Uh, which I think is disinformation to presage a false flag operation uh, to use chemical weapons or biological weapons, probably chemical weapons, by Russia 
uh, by Putin himself. Uh, so I think they know what would happen. We've also sat down, my colleagues have sat down uh, with uh, uh, the PRC and explained our sanctions so they know what they are and how they work. Uh, so we're, we're trying to be very transparent here. Uh, and I don't want to give a sense that everything with the PRC uh, is a war. We don't want to start another Cold War. Uh, we don't want conflict. We don't want miscalculation. We want channels of communication. We hope there are areas where there can be cooperation. But make no mistake, I believe that President Xi Jinping has made a decision about what he wants the PRC to be in the world. Uh, and it's a very different vision than we have in this room. Um, I love the fact that a guy asked this question about work and life. It's usually uh, the women who say to me, how the hell did you do what you did? Um, so I'm glad you're worried about it too, for yourself. Um, I don't talk about work-life balance anymore. I talk about work-life integration. One of the great things that came out of the horrible pandemic is how many people worked at home. How many, I would say, fathers uh, began to understand why we talk about TGIM, thank God it's Monday, <laughs> so we could go back to work. <laughs> um, it's very hard. There is no magic. Uh, I probably know one or two Earth Mothers, but mm, maybe not even that. It's all hard. And what I say to uh, people who want to have it all, you can, just not all at once. Not all at the same time. There are choices one has to make uh, and sacrifices. Um, kids seem to turn out okay. Children are incredibly resilient. Um, look at what we've put them through during this pandemic. Um, they've suffered. We all need to pay attention to mental health. I say to all of our ambassadors who are going out, their first, second, and third priority is their team, their colleagues, uh, who've been through a lot because of the pandemic and because of the changes in our administration because the world's hard, right, really hard right now. So to please pay attention to mental health. And if you think, I mean, there are times in my life I've struggled and I've gone and gotten help. And so I encourage people to do the same. And if you see a colleague struggling, urge them to get help now before they burn out and can't do it anymore. Uh, and then how do you identify a successful leader? What I was doing at Harvard besides teaching is I was the, um, director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, to talk about leaders. And I actually, I know a lot of people think leaders are born, they can't be made. I don't agree with that. Mm. I think leaders can be made. Uh, for some people, it's easier than others. And it's perfectly fine if you decide that the best way you lead is behind the curtain instead of in front of the curtain. Mm. Leadership is not always about being the person on TV. Uh, or sitting up here and giving a speech. I have folks on my team who are phenomenal leaders and you'll never know who they are because they lead in a different way, they bring different talents to the table. And so valuing that talent and urging them to stay in the public space because we need all of that talent in the public space uh, is what I'm about. Thank you for that. Um, Time is running out, folks, and I want to be able to take a round of three if I can. Um, I'm going to gentleman at the back. I also want to check whether we have Sam Fleming and or Daniel Michaels in the room. Sam clearly was meant to be. I thought I'd err on one or two journalists just to give them, just to be fair and, you know, but be brief. Very brief. Thanks. Sam Fleming from the Financial Times. Um, two brief questions. First of all, there's obviously See, a great... that's a journalist for you. <laughs> <laughs> two brief questions. Two brief questions. Um, I'll, I'll generally brief. Um, the EU seems to be moving towards uh, um, sanctions on Russian oil exports. The question, obviously, is whether 
um, that oil will find other markets around the world and potentially at a higher price. Are you confident that this will do the requisite damage that you want to see to the fossil fuels industry of Russia? A related question, uh, Ursula von der Leyen is visiting India on Monday, Sunday and Monday. Um, India is obviously a purchaser of Russian oil and also has a long-standing partnership with Russia. What is your message to India uh, when it comes to this, this, this war and, uh, and its role uh, and dialogue with Russia? Thank you. Good Never question. been asked either of those questions. That's good a joke. Question, good question. Um, gentleman here in the beige suit, and then I'll come to you. But I'm saying, can I say to all of you, I'm banning two questions. It's okay, one. Just one. I'm Mark van Kranenburg, and I'm a trainee at the European Parliament. In 2011, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said, and I quote, a thriving China is good for America, and a thriving America is good for China. And I'm a wondering, thriving? A thriving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, two U.S. presidential administrations later, and more than two, uh, ten, con, uh, 10 years, do you agree with this, or to what extent should we view the U.S.-China relationship as a zero-sum game? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and gentlemen in the back. Dan Michaels with the Wall Street Journal. Um, to follow up on Sam's question, uh, how close are we to the U.S. imposing secondary sanctions on Russian energy, or is that off the table? One question. Thank Lovely. You. Okay, so I'm going to take the two journalists and then uh, come to the real question. <laughs> I joke. My husband was a journalist for years. I love you guys. Um, so, um, look, I'm not going to make choices for the European Union and for Europe. Uh, the United States and our EU and NATO allies and our partners around the world because there are partners in other parts of the world that are, have also imposed sanctions. It's not just the transatlantic relationship. Um, uh, what we have all tried to make sure that whatever we do hurts Putin. What we are aiming for here is a strategic failure for Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin. And I believe that is already happening. That no matter what happens, and my belief is that Ukraine is going to survive and thrive, Putin is facing a strategic failure because of the sanctions that have been put on, because of the long-term impact. This will have your FT in Wall Street Journal. You know that when you impose sanctions and export controls, the tail on that is pretty long. Uh, you've driven industries. We have hundreds of U.S. companies, literally, who have left Russia, and they're not returning. So the tail here is very long. There will be strategic failure. Putin has become a pariah in the world. Uh, and people are worried, to your question of secondary sanctions, the United States uses secondary sanctions. You know that. Uh, we have said to countries who are uh, evading these sanctions that, they're going to pay a price. Uh, Europe has not been a great fan of secondary sanctions. No one should be a fan because who wants to close down any part of an economic system, world system? But sometimes it's necessary as an enforcement tool, and it is here. Uh, and so uh, we are going to work with our colleagues here in Europe and around the world. Whatever we impose in terms of consequences will hurt the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin. Does that mean we won't pay any price? Of course, we're already paying a price for our sanctions. It's already tough for families, for people all over the world because of this war, this unprovoked, unjust, premeditated war that Putin has started. Uh, so that's where we are, and we're going to support the European Union, the Transatlantic Alliance, other partners around the world to find the best way forward. We're never quite identical in what we do, but we're all trying to achieve the same thing. And we talk to each other 500 times a day to make sure we achieve that. And to your point, whatever we do, or Europe chooses to do on oil and gas, of course we don't want to drive the price up, because that helps Vladimir Putin. So you have to figure out how can you do something that's effective without driving up uh, the income that Vladimir Putin will get. So that's, a, that's something everyone's working on. On India, I was saying to colleagues beforehand, 
I testified in front of the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee for about three hours, just me. Um, there are 45 members of that committee. It's, it's a lot of questions, but a lot on India. And here's what I believe. India is incredibly consequential country for all of us. It is a democracy. It's a messy democracy, but so are we. You may have noticed we've had a few events in the last couple of years that are pretty messy in the United States. So they're not an easy democracy, but they're a, they're a young democracy. And they are very worried about the PRC. They understand that um, their future, which was, their military, which was built on Russian weapons, probably doesn't have a future with Russian weapons anymore because our sanctions have pulled back the military industrial complex of Russia and it's not coming back anytime soon. So we're going to work with India uh, to support uh, them as a growing and important and consequential democracy, which they are. And by 2030, they're going to be the largest everything, the largest wealthy class, the largest middle class, probably the largest poor class, but they're the largest everything. And they're a partner with us, and they're a partner in the Asia Quad along with Australia and Japan. And then on what um, uh, Secretary Clinton said, if that is an exact quote, and I'll assume it is, um, of course we believe that countries that thrive, if they play by the rules that we all play by, should thrive. We do not have a desire to hold China down. We are very glad that China was able to reduce the poverty in their country by a staggering percentage. They were able to do that because of the benefits of the rules-based international order. And so, yes, all for the PRC thriving, for their people doing better. I'd like them to have more human rights. I'd like there to not be censorship. I'd like people's voices to be heard. I'd like the internet to be used for free and openness, not as a surveillance tool. But sure, I want them to thrive if they will play by the rules-based order. And I will just note, interestingly, when the pandemic began, I think, I'll speak for myself, I was impressed by how China tried to get on top of it, uh, tried to you know, ensure that their country could keep moving forward. We all got on top of it, and sort of you know, one step forward, two steps back. Things were very messy in my country. But look at us. We're sitting here without masks. Hopefully, I'm not going to return to the United States with COVID, but we're all sitting here without masks. And what's happening? In China, they have shut down their second largest city. Millions, millions and millions of people. I don't know how many of you have been to Shanghai, but it's one of the most bustling cities on the face of the earth. It's a financial center. Supply chain problems were a huge problem. They're now even a more huge problem because there are so many ships sitting because of the lockdown. So yeah, we're messy. We got to where we are, sitting here with each other, without masks on. I'll stop there. Thank you. I've got a strategic failure here, which is apparently audiovisual for our live stream audience. Oh, I'm so bottle. sorry. But it's a bit late. I because apologize. It's, it's, it's over because it's <laughs> four o'clock. <laughs> Colleagues, I do apologize. I wanted to, we could have gone on for a long time, but you know, uh, she has an important job and it's full full hilt schedule. Before you leave, though. Uh, just 60 seconds. Can we indulge me, indulge us? Let's talk about women uh, in a good way. Um, in that one of the priorities for us as an organisation is to think about women as enablers, builders and keepers of peace. And a really important aspect that we seem to forget how 50% of the world's population could actually generate a different reaction and response. Your thoughts on that? There is data that shows that when women are involved in peace and security that the peace that is achieved is more durable over time. Uh, and I'm a big believer in women being involved in everything and anything they want to be involved in. Same thing for you guys. Um, I think that one of the things that, uh, I was going to say Secretary Albright, but for these purposes I'm going to say Madeline, uh, taught me, however, as a diplomat, is that when 
I'm doing whatever I do. When I was uh, honored to lead the U.S. negotiating team for the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action known as the Iran deal, um, I was less Wendy Sherman, uh, less the silver-haired person, less uh, not so much a Jewish American as I was the United States of America. It wasn't really about whether I was a woman, and for those of you who know, Helga Schmidt was uh, my counterpart, um, former Secretary General mm -hmm. of uh, uh, EEAS. Um, Kathy Ashton and then Federica Mogherini uh, were the high representative uh, during these deals. C really crazy to have three women with an all-male Iranian delegation. <laughs> and I must say most of the European delegations were Indeed, <laughs> men. <laughs> yes. uh, by the end, because we were so many women at the top of this process, more women came into the delegations. I think they wanted to prove to us they actually had women. Uh, so. Uh, so I think we have to be a little humble. Uh, I think I can be uh, tough and difficult uh, and challenging, um, but I hope what we understand, and I could go into a long exegesis about how I believe that women define their, themselves in relationship to other people, and men generally, I'm being overly reductionist here, men generally define themselves by who supports them to lead, very vertical. We could go real far with these metaphors. But anyway, um, so I do think we come at things differently. But ultimately, when you're a diplomat, you bring to the table the power of your role, the power of your country, the power of your being and your presence. And that's what gets you to the end of the road. So I believe women should be engaged in all of these things. Yes, because we tend to create more durable solutions. Uh, we'll have to figure out all the reasons why. But also because there's so much talent out there. Why Indeed. wouldn't we use all of the talent we possibly Indeed. can? Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.